The National Eye Institute has recently issued a national plan for eye and vision research. Joining us today to discuss this plan is Dr. Richard Fisher. Dr. Fisher is the Associate Director for Science Policy and Legislation at the National Eye Institute and is the Director of NEI's Office of Program Planning and Analysis. He has served on numerous transnational institutes of health committees, the Institutional Review Board of Frederick Memorial Hospital, and currently is the project team leader of the NIH Roadmap Nanomedicine Initiative. Dr. Fisher. Good morning, and thank you. The, uh, it's pretty clear that we're switching gears with this talk. The, uh, what we're going to hear about now is what we don't know, not what we know or what we can figure out from, from data. And so how many people here are active vision researchers in labs? That's actually more than I thought. So I'm, I'm assuming that um, uh, you know who the NEI is, the National Eye Institute, but let me just, when I talk to researchers who are funded by the NEI, sometimes they don't even know it's a government agency. So let's start there. <laughs> you, these are smart people, right? Um, so clearly, HHS is one of the 15 departments of the President's Cabinet, and NIH is, uh, is one agency within uh, HHS. The budget for health and human services of $886 billion a year is primarily Medicare and Medicaid, uh, but NIH has a, has a pretty good-sized chunk, about $31 billion in FY 2012. And the, the Eye Institute represents 700, about $702.5 million of that. So what, what do we do? Well, we are the primary vision research organization in the world, by far the biggest. And, the, you know, I'm from the government, and I'm here to help you and tell you about, <laughs> I mean, how can I come up here without an organizational chart? So the I Institute, which is very, uh, uh, it's kind of a black box to, to people doing the research and often people on the outside. Uh, consists of two major divisions, the intramural division, which are scientists on the NIH campus in Bethesda who do, uh, do research, and the extramural world of grantees, people doing research at, primarily at universities, small businesses, uh, some small uh, uh, pharmaceutical companies. And if in the way I, we always describe the intramural program, it's 90% uh, of the people in the Eye Institute and 10% of the money. Um, the extramural, uh, most of our money goes out to universities and as, as Francis Collins has been uh, talking about the NIH lately, there are a lot of uh, jobs that are, uh, that are funded by the NIH and I think it's money well spent because we have a very rigorous process for, for granting uh, funds. So. One of the things that the I Institute has done uh, since almost since its inception is uh, in, embark on program planning activities. What we do, uh, and this started back when Dr. Uh, Carl Kupfer was the institute director in, in 1973, and about every five to seven or eight years, we uh, develop a new what we call national plan. In 2004, Dr. Uh, with Dr. Sieving uh, actually arrived in 2002, I believe, and in 2004 we, we went through the process again. And all of the plans of the, all of the institutes of NIH are on the NIH website and at report.nih.gov. I would encourage you to look at them, and they all have something in common. And what they have in common is a statement of kind of the state of the field, what we've recently discovered and more or less a list of needs and opportunities of where experts gathered together think the field is going. Um, and listing a number of opportunities and needs. And the, and the target audience is, 
there are many audiences actually, vision researchers are some, uh, Congress and congressional staff, uh, foundations, and uh, various members of the public uh, who are interested in eye and vision health. So uh, in 2011, uh, we, we embarked on yet again another planning activity, and we uh, developed what we're calling our panel reports, or our, our national plan, as we've traditionally done it for the past 40 years. We gathered experts together in panels uh, in our six, uh, uh, what I would call core program areas. These, these programs are administrative programs that, have, that were developed back in the 70s, and, and uh, actually the last one, Low Vision and Blindness Rehabilitation, was uh, developed, I think, in the 90s. But for the most part, all of the funding of research that we do in the extramural at, at uni world at, at, at universities falls, is administered by program directors in uh, these six uh, uh, program areas, retinal diseases, corneal diseases, lens and cataract, glaucoma and optic neuropathies, strabismus, amblyopia, and visual processing, and then low vision and blindness rehabilitation. The, um, everybody always wants to know, you know, well, how much is, is cornea versus retina? And if you actually look at our programs, they were developed because of surgical specialties. There's nothing, these boxes that we put uh, 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 research in are kind of artificial. But in any case, retina is by far the biggest chunk of our, of our uh, funding. Uh, followed by uh, SAVP and, and cornea. But when you look at the, the spectrum of the science that we fund, we can't define it so easily by these boxes that we originally began with. And in fact, we have a number of cross-cutting programs that are integrated with these core programs. Cross-cutting programs such as ocular genetics, infection, inflammation, immunology, myopia, refractive error, ocular pain, and uh, other more administrative type programs, not, not scientifically based. So when we gather the expertise and, and have the panel reports, we try to include experts in, in, in all of these areas of our programs to have a comprehensive document that, uh, and, and, and when we generate it, we ask the, the, the simple questions. Where are we today? and what are the needs, gaps, and opportunities going forward in vision research. And our aim is with this is to create a meaningful document to help the NEI identify scientific opportunities, fund the best science, properly direct resources, and attract and train the best and brightest to vision research. And so at the end of the day, we generated, yes, another document uh, uh, of uh, panel reports of these six core programs. And in each of the, of the reports, it has three sections. An introduction, which is, we hope, written at a level that uh, makes uh, that particular report interesting and is accessible to the, the public. We highlight some recent progress in each of the program areas, and as well as define needs, gaps, and opportunities uh, across all of our programs. As I said, we, there were about 100 uh, scientists and clinicians who were involved with generating these reports. We asked for public input. We received quite a bit. The panels uh, considered carefully the input, and then, they, and then we uh, finalized the document. And in fact, as we speak, I think it's very close to being printed. So um, uh, this will be out, I would say, the next week or two. Uh, you, uh, we, we hope that you'll go to our website, nei.nih.gov, to see it, to download it. We have a, a few copies that, uh, of course, with the, with the fiscal restraints, we're, we're printing very few of them, but uh, this will be a, a, a PDF version on, online available to everyone. So the question is, uh, are we done? And in the past, we have been done. We'd wait another five or seven years, go through the process again. And the, the thing that we decided is that we're not done because the times have changed. Times are different. The, and I would say that of, of all uh, the complaints that we get at the NIH, at the NEI, 
is that we are uh, too conservative. The NIH just takes grant applications and boy, you better have most of the work done or you're never going to get funded. And so we wanted to try and, and address that and we wanted to recognize the fact that what's, what's happened with eye research over the last 10 years? Well, if you start um, in 2001 after the human genome was sequenced, um, we have uh, genetic risk for AMD in 2005 was identified, uh, human ocular RPE65 gene therapy in 2008, um, and now most recently we're actually growing uh, eyes in a dish. I mean, we can, we can, we're starting to repeat using stem cells the, the early developmental process. These are we can't imagine, we couldn't imagine this 15 years ago, sorry. And so, with that in mind, what can we do that we can't imagine now? We've asked the experts, the people who've been doing research, to give us their best input. But as we all know, we think linearly. <laughs> we don't think exponentially. And things in science and medicine happen exponentially. And so we, we decided that it's time to do something different with our planning. We're not going to do the same old, same old. So the next phase of our planning we're, is, is a phase where we want to identify uh, what we're referring to as audacious goals. Now, as soon as I say the word audacious, people have all kinds of ideas of what that means. And so, uh, in, in fact, as we were developing uh, these ideas, we worked with our advisory council, and we had to define audacious before we went forward. So bold, daring, extremely original, without restriction to prior ideas, highly inventive. We want to take a different look in a different way than we've ever done before. And so we, um, we want to stimulate innovative thinking toward developing a national vision research agenda. Not just identify goals for the NEI, but let's even have a more broad uh, perspective. And, and once we identify these, these goals, um, that will really help set vision research priorities for the Institute, as well as, as we hope, for research organizations uh, all over the world. So the objectives of this second phase of our planning are the following. We want it to be an inclusive process. We want to engage the wide community of vision researchers and others beyond typical experienced NIH-funded investigators. We've never done that. We don't want to ignore the hard work that went into generating these panel reports. That would be silly. That would be, uh, the, that, that's the work of people who are intimate with the research and they've spent time uh, thinking about where they think the field should be going what, and what's needed. But we so we want to use that as a springboard to the next step. Uh, we want to identify a fixed number of audacious goals. We don't want to have a, a laundry list. In fact, if you look at the panel reports, you can come up with a list of needs and opportunities across all of our programs. Some of them seem very important. Some of them, it, it's, it's difficult to know because we can't make predictions about the direction and the twists and turns of doing research. And we want, to, uh, we want to cast that wide net and winnow from many ideas into a few. Um, I think most of all, what, what we've heard in the past from some of our planning efforts is, well, you know, we didn't know this was going on, we found out late. We want to make this process transparent. And I think one of the, mo the, the most important aspects of this is we want to energize the research community with a, a new and exciting process. I would say, um, before I go into the process, I would say that we don't know this is an experiment and it's going to be different from what we've done in the past. We're hoping that, um, that uh, people get excited about it. 
So the best way to, to actually de describe what we mean by audacious goals is, is with a couple of historical examples. I'll just mention uh, 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 developing gene therapy to treat an inherited retinal degeneration to cure patients in less than 10 years. Well, if we would have done that, if we would have proposed that in 1993, it might have been uh, uh, audacious. That's when the uh, RP65 was, was cloned. Um, it's obvious in 1961, if you say, let's put a man on the moon, uh, that, that was pretty audacious. But it really excited the community and made, made it, that we made it happen by just identifying it. I don't think that we're going to put the kind of resources into to any goal that we would need to put into putting a man on the moon. But it's the idea of looking beyond what we think and looking bigger than what, what happens in one research lab or one university or even maybe one center. Um, let me, so let me go on to the, the process that we, that we plan to go through. Now, I'm, I must say that this, has been, this is still in development. We, had a, uh, we've had a couple of discussions with our advisory council, and uh, just last Thursday, we've got final uh, agreement to go forward with this. It's not uh, uh, available yet, but it's obviously public because we talked about it in the, in the public session of our council. So um, let me just tell you quickly what the overall process will be. We're going to cast a wide net to capture ideas. I don't know how familiar you are with citizen scientist or crowdsourcing or the idea that maybe the experts don't have all the answers. Maybe people in this audience have answers. Maybe there are people in business who have ideas that we haven't considered. It's possible. We don't know. So we want to why, so we are going to uh, uh, put a, have a competition, which, we, which we're going to call the NEI challenge to identify audacious goals. Um, and the entry for this competition it was, is simply a one-page concept. Give us your idea of where we can go in the next five to ten years. What can, we, what can we do that maybe we can't imagine, maybe isn't in those panel reports? It's bigger than any one research project. I mean, when we get the experts together for, for, the, uh, for the, our normal planning, their focus, no matter how many times we say, think big, think bigger than your lab, well, they're thinking that they've got their next grant application, and they're not going to forget about that. No matter, uh, they try, they, they, do, they do their best, but... So we're going to uh, hopefully get lots of ideas. We're going to review them. And we're going to select 20 of them as topics uh, for, that will be discussed later on at a large meeting that will help us to refine them and identify our audacious goals. So we'll start off with what we would consider audacious concepts and end up with audacious goals for vision research. And we want mathematicians, we want uh, computer scientists, we want physicists who maybe would normally not pay attention to the problems of, of vision research, of, 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 of visual disorders and, and blindness rehabilitation. So we're offering a, a cash prize. And it's going to be a, a, a prize competition, which is actually a new authority that that the, that the government agencies have been granted by the Obama administration. And we're hoping that this is what makes people pay attention, people outside of the typical vision research community. So as I said, the, the concepts will be discussed at an audacious goals meeting, and then there will be a report, and, and the, the audacious goals, all the concepts, everything will be on, uh, on the website. And then, um, so I'll, I'll give you a little uh, a short uh, timeline of this. We're hoping to release this, uh, the challenge uh, probably in August. We have a number of clearances to go through, as you, as you might imagine, in the government. In the fall, the, um, the competition will probably close in late fall. Um, in December or January, the, the concepts would be selected for discussion. And then the meeting would probably be in March of 2013. And then final, uh, 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 after that, the 
Advisory Council and the I Institute would develop an impl implementation plan for addressing those goals and setting our priorities. And so with that, I will uh, end it. That's our, that's our plan for the future, our hope, and I, uh, if there's time, I'd be happy to take questions.